Yeah. Anyway, my, before we went on vacation, my last sermon, I spoke about obedience. Does anybody remember any of that? Yes, just a couple head nods, right? I spoke about obedience and the importance of obedience. And uh, so I'm going to kind of dovetail a little bit into that. And I wanna, I'm going to show you from the scriptures, again, what it's like to have the blessing of God in your life. But then when you walk away from the Father how God the Father will also separate Himself from you, right? And we need to be extremely aware of those things because I believe that in this day, this time, and this hour, that you and I are going to be challenged. Our faith is going to be challenged. Many of us, our faith is already being challenged, isn't it? Many of us, it's, maybe it's a health issue, maybe it's a financial issue, maybe it's a, a work issue, right? Maybe a spiritual issue, whatever that might be. God is greater than. Can you say that with me? God is greater than. We, we've got to come to an understanding of the magnitude of who God truly is. When I stand on the pulpit and I tell you that God created you, you, you must by faith believe that God created you. By faith, you've got to swallow that pill. Hello? And then, now believing that, you've got to walk through that. You've got to believe and know and trust that you are a child of the Most High God. Amen. Amen. When when we were traveling back, I think we were in South Carolina, I believe. We stopped to get something to eat on the way back home. You know, and and just the one lady that was there, and she just said, How are you this morning? I said, I am blessed. And she was like, Oh, hallelujah, somebody to talk to. (laughs) Amen. So, right? So you've got to engage that. Hallelujah. I said in highly favored. She goes, oh, Lord, we're going to have church. Amen. <laughs> so it was, it was good. It was a good breakfast. Yes? Yeah. Amen. So we got to come to that. Wherever you are, God's already there. Wherever you've been, God's already been there. Hello? And he's already healed what's behind you. You and I, we cannot change what we have done in our past. We can't change it. The only thing you and I can do is learn from it and move forward. Amen? If you've asked God to forgive you of the things that you've done in your past, swallow this pill. He has. Hello? He has. Say, He has. He has forgiven you and He has forgiven me of the things that we have done in our past. You've got to believe that by faith and now you've got to walk it out. I see too many Christians today that are walking defeated by Satan already. The war hasn't even started yet. And walking, we're walking around defeated. We spoke to a little bit in praise and worship. Look, I'm looking for a church that's ready to jump a pew during praise and worship. Amen? Amen? I, I, I'm one of those people I cannot not worship God. I have to worship God. It's in me. I just, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't understand those that can't. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's okay to let go and let God Amen. worship the Heavenly Father, right? Yeah. Amen, come on. Yeah. So my last sermon, I talked about obedience, and we learned from in the book of Hebrews that our, our disobedience is, comes from our unbelief. Yeah. It comes from our unbelief. So when we read God's Word, we've got to realize and come to the understanding that God's Word is truth. You understand? Say truth. Truth. God's Word is truth. You just, you by faith, you just have to believe that. And now walk through that. Just like our sister did with her her, uh, heart catheter that she had to go through. She was trusting and believing. She claimed what was going to occur before it occurred. She said, this is my prayer, this is my desire. And it's exactly what occurred. Amen? Amen. She didn't want a pacemaker. She doesn't have a pacemaker. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen. You've got to be able to walk it out, but it's by faith. Draw closer unto me and I shall draw closer unto you, is what the Father tells us. We need to start drawing closer unto him. Even on vacation, we were drawn close unto Him. Just because I was on vacation did, does not mean that I did not read my Bible. You understand that? A lot of us, when we go on vacation, we go on vacation. 
We ain't doing nothing that we do normally in the world. Well, let me tell you something. My vacation wouldn't have occurred if it wasn't for this book. Amen? My peace wouldn't have been there if it wasn't for this book. Hallelujah. If it wasn't for God in my life, we wouldn't have had the joy that we had, the peace that we had, the re-energizing that we got. Can you say amen? amen? You can enjoy that same thing. It's time for you. Too many of us, too many of us walk in defeat. And it's sad to see from a pastor's standpoint. The disciples came to Christ and they said, how are we going to know others that are followers of the way? And Jesus said, you will know them by their fruit. In the book of Galatians in chapter 5 and verses 23 and 24, it talks about that fruit. And that fruit is the fruit of the Spirit. And that is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, and temperance. There's nine of them. Most Christians that I see are missing the first three, love, joy, and peace. You and I, we need to love one another, as our brother talked about this morning during announcements. Joy, don't let Satan steal your joy. Hello? Don't let Satan steal your joy. We could have went on vacation and just had a bummer time. And done absolutely nothing, just like, this is just horrible. we got to leave in seven days. We gotta, we're out of here. we got to leave. Right? I literally talked to someone in my workplace, my work environment, that, that as they talked about their vacation that was up and coming, and it's now past, but was up and coming, they were defeating their vacation before it took place. In other words, they said, I'm, I'm, I'm going on vacation next week. I'm leaving for vacation. But it's going to go so fast, and then I'm going to have to turn around, and I'm going to have to come right back here, and it's just going to be like I had no fun at all, and I'm like, you're already defeated. I said, you know what? You shouldn't even go. <laughs> Amen? You, church, we've got to find joy, and our joy comes from the Lord. Amen. And if you're not spending that time in the morning, every morning with the Lord, when your day starts, for me, it's in the morning. Other people, it might be at night. For me, it's in the morning. That's how my day goes. Little things are going to come up. Don't let, so what? Don't let it ruffle your, your day. Don't let it ruin your day. Amen? I mean, there, there's no need for that. I had people that were telling me I was number one driving on the way down to Florida. I was like, yes, I am. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. I have a motto when I drive, move or be mowed. Amen? <laughs> Amen? There was a comedian that said this once, and I'm thinking, I can relate. He's like, have you ever been driving down the road and you see somebody that they're, they're, they're going fast, they speed up, and then they slow down. They speed up, and so then you're behind them. I call them yum-yums, right? They drive you crazy, don't they? So you try to pass the yum-yum, and all of a sudden the yum-yum speeds up. They realize, oh, okay, this guy's going to pass me now, right? It's like a drag race, right, all of a sudden, okay? And then you get behind, and then you catch up to all the other traffic, which you were trying to get around. And there's five or six cars, and you're standing there going, what's, what's the whole? And then that one car just buzzes from way back. He's five cars back, and he passes all the people to get to the front. I'm that guy. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> Amen? Because there's limitations that I can only go so far. The speed limit says 70 miles an hour on the highway not 55. If there's nothing blocking you, go 70 mile an hour. Hello? Your car will do it. They built them today to do that. Amen? So if you see me and I'm passing you on a highway, you just toot and wave. Amen? Right? Because you're just going to be a cloud of dust to me in a minute. Right? You're gone. I won't even see you in my rearview mirror here in about 30 seconds. <laughs> You're looking at me like I got nine heads. Come on. You know you all do it too. Men, where are you at? Where's my man? Come on. You got to represent, right? Amen. Tell me, I'm not, tell me I'm not correct with this. You're driving and a wife says, I need to go to the restroom. My mind goes, oh. I whip into the restroom and all I can think about 
I'm standing outside and I'm going, I passed that dude right there. I got, I got, I'm thinking about all the people I got to pass all over again that I just passed on a highway. Tell me I'm lying. Hello? (laughs) Amen? Right? Move or be mowed. That's the motto. Hallelujah. That's not the title of my sermon, by the way. Amen? (laughs) You got to (laughs) believe. You got to believe, right? Our obedience to the Father is what He desires of you and I more than anything else. You got to understand the obedience that God has placed into each and every one of us. The fall started way back with Adam and Eve who partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Therefore, you and I, we know good and we know evil. We know it. We pretend that we don't. Either to please others or to please ourselves. Nah, right? You know when you're doing something wrong because the Holy Spirit checks you. That's his job. That's what he's designed to do is to check us. Can you say amen? Amen. So we need to know when God sends the Holy Spirit to check you and I, there's something we're doing amiss or wrong that we need to come back in line with the Father. Does that make sense? Amen? King Solomon talked an awful lot about that. Or lived that, should I say it more that way. Open your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 3 and starting in verse 1. When you get there, give me an amen. Amen. I'm going to read 1 through 5. It says, Now Solomon made a treaty with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married Pharaoh's daughter. Then he brought her to the city of David until he had finished building his own house in the house of the Lord and the wall all around Jerusalem. Do you ever wonder who built the wall around Jerusalem? Now you know. Amen. Meanwhile, the people sacrificed at high places because there was no house built for the name of the Lord until those days. And Solomon loved the Lord. Say, Solomon loved the Lord. Walking in the statutes of his father David, except that he sacrificed and burned incense at the high places. Now the king went to Gibeon and sacrificed there, for that was the great high place. Solomon offered A thousand burnt offerings upon the altar. Say a thousand burnt offerings. That's a lot. At Gibeon, and the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, ask, what shall I give you? Amen? So first we see that Solomon is in a dream. God's going to speak to you and I also through dreams. God will allow you to see things in a dream. And you've heard me say this before, you, God usually wakes me up or, or, or I feel his presence around 3 a.m. And that's because that's when I'm the most quiet. Amen? My mouth shut, I'm snoring usually at 3 a.m. But that's when he wakes me up. And that's when he talks to me. Can you say amen? amen. And Solomon in verse 9, he's, he's asking, he says, therefore, forgive Therefore, give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? The speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. Then God said unto him, Because you have asked for this thing and have not asked, say not asked, long life for yourself, nor have asked for riches for yourself, nor have asked the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern justice. Behold, I have done according to your words. See uh, that I have given unto you a wise and understanding heart, so that there has not been anyone like you before you, nor shall any like you arise after you. And I have also given unto you what you have not asked for, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be anyone like you among the kings all your days. Now, we get, now I want to stop there for a second. And you've got to look at what God is, is blessing Solomon with. Solomon didn't ask for riches. He asked for understanding so that he may judge rightly between good and evil. He was asking for wisdom. Amen? And because he wasn't asking for the riches, God also gave that to him. 
If you've ever thought about, you know, gee, if there was such a thing as genies, what would be my three wishes? What would I do with those things? I bet every one of us had in there to, to be wealthy so I wouldn't have to worry about money. Somewhere along that line. That's not what he's asking for. He was asking for wisdom. He was asking for understanding. And I want you to notice in verse 14, right? God says, so if... Remember, that's the biggest word in the Bible, right? If you walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. So if, and then if you are obedient, then God will bless you. You understand that? Too many of us, we walk around and we want God's blessing. Give me God's blessing. Give me God's blessing. I want your blessing, Father. Bless me, O Lord. But we're not walking in the if. We're not walking what it is that God would have you and I to do. Are we being obedient to His Word? Are we being obedient to His Bible? Are we being obedient to His commandments? Are we being obedient to His Son, Jesus Christ? Are we being obedient one unto another? Amen? We've got to believe that God's Word is truth. We first must believe that He is. That's God's Word. Doesn't it tell us that? One must believe that He is. you got to remember in the book of James, it tells us that even the demonic spirits, even the demons believe, yet they tremble. What, is it, what are they saying? Well, the demons believe, but it's not a matter of belief. It's a matter of doing. Are you a doer of God's Word and not a hearer only? deceiving yourselves that's what God's word says in Timothy deceiving yourselves if you're not doing what God's word says you're just hearing it say oh man yeah I believe it but you're not doing it are you living out the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ amen you got to walk we've well, got to walk it in this day and age I wouldn't want any other walk <laughs> it's it's not an easy walk when you become a Christian, everything doesn't go away and everything becomes all perfect and fine and no more problems, and, right? It just gives you the strength to endure the race that's set before you and I, yes? But notice that, if and then. That struck me, right? Solomon asked for understanding that day. Oh my. Go to chapter 4, if you will. Verse 29. And I want you to see the love of the Father. And it says, And God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great. Say exceedingly great. And gave him exceedingly great understanding and largeness of heart like the sand on the seashore. Now, now he gives you something that, that you can kind of view or picture, right? As the sand on the seashore, sand on the seashore, we just came from there. There's a whole bunch of it, like a whole bunch of it, right? And it's a gorgeous place, but he enlarged his heart, meaning he had compassion for people. You and I got to have passion for people, compassion for people, empathy for one another. Empathy is the ability to sit with a person and, and talk with them for a length of time even though it's killing you to be sitting there listening to them over that length of time. Truly from your heart, listening to what it is that they are saying and what it is that they are doing. And all of us, myself included, fall short at times with that. On Sunday mornings, I'm usually running around here way busier than I need to be, right? And some of you come up and you want to tell me what's going on in your life, and usually... I ask you to please don't do that before I come up onto the pulpit because it kind of dictates my thought process. I'm trying to be in, in with the Father, yes? You may, okay. So I may be, sound a little stern, like I'm well, not right now, please. I'll talk to you after service. I didn't mean that to offend you. It's just that I, I, I got I to gotta try to stay in tune with the Father and the Holy Spirit before I bring forth His Word. Yes? Does that make sense? Yeah, amen. Yeah, that's good. Cla clapping's good. You can clap. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. There you go. That was weak. All right. <laughs> what did God do? God blessed the obedience of Solomon. 
He blessed his obedience. Solomon wasn't asking for riches. He wasn't asking for anything. He was only asking for wisdom. Think about that for a second. And God blessed him abundantly, above and beyond what it is that he had asked for. Can I make it real plain today? God will do the exact same thing for you and for I if we're doing it with a pure heart. If we're doing it with the right mindset. Because many of us, I would love to have a mansion down on the beach. Who wouldn't? Right? Hello? Right? Sure we would. Okay? But God knows that maybe that's a desire. And God will grant you that desire. But are you being obedient in the little things? If you see your, your brother... That, that might be hurt. Maybe he's at the gas station and all of a sudden he pulls, he, he pulls out his pocket and, and there's nothing there. And he's, oh my goodness, so I got $20 of gas and I don't, I don't have, I, and so what do you do? Do you go pay his 20 bucks? You know, what's the Holy Spirit tell you to do? And if the Holy Spirit is leading you in a direction to go do something for a friend or for a brother, do it. Don't wait, do it. Because God will choose someone else. And you will miss a blessing. Solomon was blessed because he was following all of the ways of his father, David. Right? Everything that he saw his father doing, he did. But he did according to the father. A worship of the father. Yes? And God blessed it. And God blessed it abundantly. Can you say amen? amen. In verse 32, if you'll look down there, it says that he spoke 3,000 proverbs. And his songs were 1,005, right? His Proverbs, Proverbs are wisdom that is spoken out. I love the book of Proverbs. How many, how many of you, when you get into the book of Proverbs, you read and you go, man, that is really good, right? Boy, does that just fit for where I'm at right now. Hey, Amen. Amen. Solomon had the same mindset as you, and you have the same mindset as Solomon. Amen. You understand that? Amen. Get, the, get a hold of that. You've got to get a hold of that. You have that same mindset. So whenever we see those things in those Proverbs, when they come alive to us, and through his worship, just like his father David, every time David was in trouble, he wrote a song. Yeah. He wrote a song and worshiped a father. Yeah. Here it says that Solomon wrote, his songs were 1,005. He too wrote songs. God's word says that we are to train up a child in the way they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. Solomon lived that out. Hello? He was trained up in the Lord, in the ways of the Lord. He didn't depart from it yet. Amen? So we've got to come to that, that knowledge and that understanding of how these things will go. God blesses his obedience. And then Solomon he builds the temple. If you go to chapter 5, 1 Kings, I'm sorry, 6, starting in verse 11. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to Solomon, saying, Concerning this temple which you are building. You with me? Concerning this temple which you are building, if, there it is again, if, you walk in my statutes, execute my judgments, keep all my commands and walk in them, then I will perform my word with you, which I spoke to your father David. And I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. Notice he says, if and then. So if, if we walk out the things that God has showed us to do, then he will bless us. Again, we try to put the, the cart before the horse and we try to ask for God's blessing first before we're willing to do the work. You've got to be able to be willing to do the work. Does that make sense? You've got to be willing to be obedient unto the Father. It's not always easy. It's not always easy. And sometimes it becomes very challenging, doesn't it? Very challenging. Did you know that it took Solomon seven years to build that temple? Seven years. Go with me to chapter 8. Let's see. Where am I at here? Let's 
63, I believe, is where I'm going. Yes. Oh, 62. Right? 862. It says, The king and all Israel with him offered sacrifices before the Lord, and Solomon offered a sacrifice of peace offering. Say a peace offering. Peace. Amen. Uh, which he offered unto the Lord. Get this number, 22,000 bulls and 120,000 sheep. Okay? He offered an awful lot of animals. That was a massive slaughter of animals, wasn't it? Think, think about that. That's an awful lot of bulls, first and foremost. And anybody that's ever been on a farm, you understand a bull could be like a, a little angry creature. All right, a very large angry creature. 22,000 of them put together. I think that could be a little bit of a challenge, unless, unless God's hand is upon you. And he offered them upon the altar. And a myriad of sheep. In today's world, I think the animal rights activists would go ballistic. Hello? Hello? And if you read in the book of Revelation when it talks about the Antichrist coming, it says that he stops the sacrifices of the animals. I'm willing to bet he's an animal rights activist. Think about it. Because it says the temple's going to be built and they're going to start up again, right? Hello? And they're going to start sacrificing animals again. And I think that the Antichrist is going to put a stop to that. Because they're going to see the masses amount of sacrificial animals. It's just my belief. Think about it though. Makes sense. Fits. Yes? Yes? yes. Hallelujah. He dedicated the temple with 22,000 bulls and 120,000 sheep. Look at chapter 9, starting in verse 2. You know what, I'll just start in verse 1. It'll make all the sense in the world. And it came to pass when Solomon had finished building the house of the Lord and the king's house and all Solomon's desire, which he wanted to do, that the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time, and he had appeared to him at Gibeon. And the Lord said unto him, I have heard your prayer and your supplication that you have made before me. I have consecrated this house which you have built to put my name there forever, and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. Verse 4, Now if <laughs> you walk before me as your father David walked, in integrity of heart and in uprightness, say integrity of heart, to do according to all that I have commanded you, and if you keep my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom over Israel forever, as I promised David your father, saying, you shall not fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. Verse 6, but if you or your sons at all turn from following me and do not keep my commandments and my statutes, which I have set before you, but go and serve other gods to worship them, them then I will cut off Israel from the land which I have given unto them. And this house which I have consecrated for my name, I will cast out of my sight. Israel will be a proverb and a byword among all people. Oh boy. We see the words if and then again, don't we? He is coming to Solomon and again, the second time that he has visited with Solomon, and he's telling him, look, if you keep my statutes and your sons keep my statutes. That means Solomon now has a job to do, i.e. that is to train up his children in the way that they should go. Yes? So he is to show his sons the things that they are supposed to be doing as well for the temple of God. For the lives that they are to live out. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. If you go to chapter 10, and it's just amazing how this all falls into place. It says, uh, some, in chapter 10, you've got to understand that the queen of Sheba comes out because she has heard of Solomon. 
She has heard of his greatness. She has heard of all of his wisdom and all of his wealth, that there is none like him upon the earth. So the queen of Sheba comes on the scene. It says, Now when the queen of Sheba heard the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to test him with hard questions. In other words, she wasn't sold. She wanted to know that he was everything that he, she's heard him to be. Can you say amen to that? Is this guy everything that he's all cracked up to be? She came to Jerusalem with very great re, uh, retinue. That means with a multitude of people. With camels that bore spices very much gold and precious stones. And when she came, <coughs> excuse me, and when she came to Solomon... She spoke with him about all that was within her heart. So Solomon answered all of her questions, and there was nothing so difficult for the king that he could not explain it to her. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food at his table, the seating of his servants, the service of his waiters and their apparel, his cupbearers, and his entryway by which he went up to the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. Lowercase s. There was no more spirit in her. There was no more judging of Solomon. There was no more guessing as to whether or not he was as famous as he, that she'd been hearing that he was. That he had the amount of wisdom that everybody said that he had. She looked around and she saw everything that he had. The magnitude of what he had. And if you notice, it says the entrance up into the temple where he worshipped the Father, where he worshipped the Lord. That entryway was from his house right into the temple. Let me make it simple. He, he was in, in his parsonage to the church. Okay? So he built it right in. That's, that's, that's a king who worships the Father. Can you say amen to that? Hallelujah. So we, we know and we see now that there is great riches that have been involved. If you look at verse 10... It says, then she, meaning queen of Sheba, gave the king 120 talents of gold, spices in great quantity, and precious stones. There never again such an abundance of spices as the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. Also the ships of Hiram, which brought gold from Orph, brought great quantities of almug wood and precious stones from Ophir. People just began to bring in, and listen, they weren't bringing it in because of Solomon. They were bringing it in because of the presence of the Father that was on Solomon. You and I, you got to understand when the presence of God is upon you, that he is going to bless you. Just like Joseph. When Joseph was locked up in prison, God's presence was still with Joseph, and he blessed Joseph even though Joseph was in prison. That he had favor even in prison. You and I are still going to have that same favor. Just like Paul and Silas when they were in prison. They were in prison. They were in chains. It says that they were shackled. That means their ankles and their wrists had chains on them. And they were strapped to a wall. And in that time they worshipped God. In their time of despair. They still worshipped God. And in worshipping God he came and he set them free. Amen? The chains fell off. Can you say amen? My son kind of spoke to that a little bit today during worship, right? But there in Paul and Silas's time, it says that the other prisoners, prisoners listened to them. And so when the, chain, when the earthquake happened on that prison, all of the chains fell off of the prisoners as well. My opinion, based on how I read that, the prisoners were engaging in the worship as well. They were hearing and they were worshiping as well. Yes? Yeah. Amen? When you're having a hard time, you're having a bad day, stop at your door and worship God, He'll come find you. Yeah. Where's that at in your Bible? Oh, good Lord. John 4, 23, 24. I'm going to have t-shirts made with that on it just for you. Amen? 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 All right, everybody stand up. Everybody stand up. We're way too tired. Hallelujah. Everybody stretch. All right, sit back down. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Now we got a little bit of blood flow moving. I'll get you through to the rest of my sermon. <laughs> Praise God. The Lord bless these people. Hallelujah. Verse 14. The weight of gold that came to Solomon yearly, say yearly, yearly. was 666 talents of gold besides that which traveled from merchants from the income of traders from all the kings of Arabia and from the governors of that country. Do you understand how much gold that is? That is 22 tons of gold. Yearly. Today's cost, well over a billion dollars. Yearly. Solomon was the first billionaire on the planet. Hello? Hello? Amen? That's a lot of gold. And he had that coming in yearly. God will bless you more than you can possibly imagine, more than you can attain, more than you can hold on to. He built rooms just to store the gold in. Do you understand the magnitude of how God wants to bless you and I? You're not hearing me today. Do you understand how much God wants to bless you and I? We've got to walk in the blessings of the Father, but we've got to become one with Him. Just like Solomon was willing to do at this point. Amen? Amen. If you walk in his ways, then he will bless you. If, then. If, then. Hallelujah. We've got to be able to understand enough of God's word and to be able to follow God's word. Can you say amen to that? Oh my, there was a lot of gold. Look at chapter 11, if you will. Verses 1 through 6, it says, As many happen, but King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, women of Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sedomites, and Hittites, from the nations of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, You shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts from their gods." They will turn away your hearts after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart. For it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods. And his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. For Solomon went after Ashroth, the goddess of Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Amorites. Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and did not fully follow the Lord as did his father David. Can't you imagine? Verse 9. So the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned from the Lord God of Israel who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods but he did not keep what the Lord had commanded. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon because you have done this and have not kept my covenant and my statutes which I have commanded you I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. Solomon had everything you can possibly imagine on this planet at his disposal. Everything. And he turned to worship other gods. And I know, men, what you're thinking because of a woman. Women. A lot of women. If you're like me, I sat there and tried to do the math. Okay? That's a lot. All right? You get caught up in that. I see pastors today that get caught up in similar situations. Pastors that get caught up, mainly your TV evangelists. They get caught up in the glitz and the glamour of being a TV evangelist. Because they have security guards that, that take them everywhere. They can't interact with their congregations and their people. Because they'll get, they'll, it's weird, but they'll get mobbed. Right? When you see these very large churches, everybody wants to talk to the pastor. Everybody wants to go meet him and greet him and talk to him and, right, and pray for me. I got this going on and I got that going on and I got and I got and I got. Some of these TV evangelists, they've got several thousand 
congregates, all right? 7,000 to 10,000 of them that follow them on television. How can they possibly know each and every one? They can't. But whenever, I, I, this is what an evangelist told me personally, because he got caught up in that. Because everywhere that he went, he had a half dozen security guards that got, just like Elvis has left the building, right? They got him into a car and ushered him to the, to the hotel. From the hotel, in the car, he went on to where he had to go speak. They stood behind him backstage. After praise and worship was over, they escorted him out to the entrance to the stage. He walked on the stage himself, and he gave his sermon. As soon as he came off the sermon, they had him, and they whisked him away in the car back to the hotel. Right? And he said, you can't help but get a big head. He said, that's what happened to me. I got disconnected from the people. I got disconnected from the Father. All I was about now was about the show. And you hear other musicians, if you will, say the same thing. Elvis used to talk about that. Right? How, how it gets to you. Because you get away. Michael Jackson talked about that. Prince talked about that. A lot of these musicians that are well known. Whitney Houston talked about that. Notice some of the names that I'm saying to you. They're all dead. Understand the magnitude of the God that you and I serve. Amen. He will bless you if you are blessing Him by your obedience. All we got to do is be obedient unto the Father. When we're, we are obedient unto the Father, He's going to bless us. Can you say amen? amen? Now the trick, or the hard part, if you will, is to walk out that blessing. There was, there was a, a football, um, football team that had a perfect record. They never lost. Never. And I can't, I can't tell you how many years it was. And they made a movie about this. It was a high school football team, right? And I believe the title of the movie was Perfect Score. And, and it got to a point, obviously, where they thought, we're just going to win. And we're going to win no matter, no matter what. Well, every time you step on that field and you go to play against somebody, I don't know about you, but I, I preferred to be the underdog because yeah. that motivated me. Yeah. Amen? And then there was a team that came up, and all their desire was to, to, to beat that team, to beat that team. And they came, they came up, and they beat that team. And these kids were devastated, devastated. The media had a frenzy. They went after the coach. They were saying all this stuff to the coach. How do you feel? How does this make you feel? You lost. You, you ruined. The perfect record is no more. Coach said, I'm, I'm glad it happened. I'm glad it happened. Because now I'm going to find out what kind of team I really have. Amen. Amen. Some of us need to allow that to happen to us. I see too many Christians today, and I counsel an awful lot of pastors, believe it or not, and when I talk with these pastors, they're in that mindset that I'm a pastor. And I'm like, so what? You want to know what that means? That means that you're going to be held to a higher standard when you stand before God. Are you ready for that? Wake up. You ain't all that. Amen? You got to be real with yourself before you can be real with others. You, yes? But first and foremost, you've got to get right with the Father. Let's stand.